I ask unanimous consent that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Be allowed to speak. Mr. President, um, the Senate's sort of wrapping up its, uh, if it, its business, uh, if you will, until uh, after the election. And uh, it's ironic in a way that um, there are so many big issues in front of us as a nation, so many challenges. And we're here talking about things that uh, I'm sure are important, but once again punting, kicking the can down the road on all the big crises that are in front of us as a nation. And I have to say, Mr. President, that never before have a president and a Senate done so little when the nation's challenges are so great. Uh, people have talked about the, the fiscal cliff repeatedly. And people have talked about the uh, fiscal crisis that we find ourselves in, in, um, in terms that I think ought to frighten all Americans, certainly ought to frighten members of Congress. We talked about the most predictable crisis in, in, in American history, probably in human history. We, it's not like it's any surprise what's going to happen. We're repeatedly reminded by uh, all the experts that if we don't deal with this issue of the fiscal cliff, that it's going to have devastating, catastrophic impacts on our economy, on our national security, uh, on our country, on the American people. And yet we are not addressing and doing the things that we should be doing to, uh, to avert that disaster that's ahead of us, the fiscal cliff that faces us um, on January 1 of this next year. And it's not as if there aren't already lots of, there isn't already a lot of evidence that that we've got big problems. We just crossed the $16 trillion level in terms of our debt. We've added over a trillion dollars to the debt every single year now for the past four years since President Obama has taken office. That's $50,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. Everybody in America, man, woman, or child, has as their share now the federal debt, uh, $50,000. So it is, a, it is a fiscal crisis unlike anything that we've seen before, and it has, as I said, been predicted. The Congressional Budget Office has said that if we don't deal with the fiscal cliff, uh, that it will plunge the economy into recession. They've suggested that it will uh, reduce by 2.9 percent the size of the economy. It would actually have a contraction in the economy in the first six months of next year. They've also projected that it would drive unemployment above 9 percent. Now, granted, we're over 8% today. We've been at 8% now for 43 consecutive months. That's the longest stretch in history. In fact, if you go back to the time when the Bureau of Labor Statistics started keeping unemployment data, and you add up the 11 presidents from Harry Truman up through the end of the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration, about 60 years, there were 39 months where the unemployment rate exceeded 8%. That's 11 presidents in about 60 years of history where we've had unemployment above 8%. We've now had unemployment above 8% for 43 consecutive months. So 39 months in the first 60 years since they started keeping data, 43 months now in a row uh, under the current administration. You have the Federal Reserve telling us that if we don't deal with our fiscal crisis that uh, the economy is going to soften next year. You have ratings agencies like Moody suggesting that if we don't have a plan in place, not only to deal with the sequester that's going to occur at the end of the year in a way that is paid for, but also to deal with the longer structural problem that we have, the debt and the deficit crisis that we have in this country, that we are facing a downgrade in our credit rating. Uh, you had the World Economic Forum come out here just recently with their assessment about the, the world's most competitive economies. And back in January of 2009, when President Obama took office, the World Economic Forum found that the United States had the most, the number one most competitive economy in the world. In terms of global competitiveness, the United States was ranked number one. Now we have dropped. We dropped to fifth. And this year, just recently, as I mentioned, when they came out with their current rankings, uh, the United States had dropped down to seventh. So in a short four-year time span, we've gone from first, in terms of global competitiveness, down to seventh. Now, that, that doesn't speak well for the steps that are being taken here in this country to make America competitive in the global economy, to deal with the problems of spending and debt and the fiscal cliff that's ahead of us. 
It was interesting to note that the World Economic Forum, what did they point to in terms of their analysis? Why did they come to the conclusion that the United States had fallen from first uh, in January of 2009 when the President took office to seventh here this year? Well, they pointed out spending, debt, taxes, regulations, red tape, all the things that come from Washington, D.C., all the things that are controlled by policies here in Washington. The regulations that continue to spin out of various government agencies that drive up the cost of doing business in this country make us less competitive. The higher taxes that are being assessed on our economy in so many different ways, and of course the, all the taxes that are going to take hold, take effect uh, as part of Obamacare, the health care law that was passed a couple of years ago, begin to kick in. And so you're going to have higher taxes. You've got the, the, the red tape associated with doing business in this country and the, the bureaucracies, the mandates, the, the requirements that are imposed on our small businesses and our job creators. And then, of course, as I said, you've got this massive amount of debt that hangs like a cloud uh, over our economy in this country. All factors that contribute to this assessment that has basically downgraded the United States from the number one uh, position in terms of global competitiveness down to number seven. And so the, the question before the House is, uh, what can we do? What should we be doing to avert that crisis? Well, it strikes me at least that uh, it starts with having a plan and working together, having the President step forward with a plan that would uh, uh, make sure that our economy doesn't go into a recession next year, that makes sure that the uh, defense cuts that would occur under the sequester, which are terribly disproportionate relative to the size of the defense budget as a percentage of our total budget, uh, don't harm our national security interests, figure out ways to, to uh, solve that problem, to reduce spending in other areas, to redistribute those cuts. Defense represents only 20 percent of our entire budget, but it gets 50 percent of the cuts under this uh, across-the-board sequester that would take effect on January 1st of this year. Uh, our national security experts, our military leadership have said that if these cuts take effect, that we would have the smallest army since the beginning of World War II. You have to go back to 1940 to find a time when we would have an army that's that small. Uh, you'd have to go back to 1915 before World War I to find a time when we have a, would have a navy that is as small as it would be if these cuts take effect and the number of ships that we have at our disposal. And we would have the smallest air force literally in the history of the air force. That's what our military leadership is telling us will happen if these devastating cuts take effect. You've had the Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, the President's own uh, Secretary, uh, say that this would be catastrophic, that these cuts would be disastrous. You have the service chiefs saying the very same thing. Uh, and so we've got all this, all this right in front of us, staring us in the face. And instead of dealing with that crisis, uh, we're putting bills on the floor that really uh, don't have near the consequences, as I said, I'm sure important. I'm not uh, denigrating at all any of the legislation that the Senate's considering, but it seems to be right now geared a lot more toward the election than it is about saving the country and doing the things that are necessary to avoid this, uh, this cliff that's ahead of us and all the disastrous consequences that could come with it. Now, just as, a, uh, again, a point of fact, and I mentioned this before, but we've had now over 43 months or 43 months of 8% 8, 8 unemployment or above. We've got 23 million Americans who are either unemployed or underemployed. Uh, we have seen the data continues to suggest how sluggish our economy is, the impact that it's having on the middle class in this country. In fact, middle class Americans are continually hit by uh, continued bad news. And you start with the fact that uh, since President Obama took office, average incomes have gone down almost $4,000. Uh, you add on top of that the fact that fuel prices have literally doubled in that time frame, now more than doubled. In fact, we hit in the month of September, this month, the highest fuel price ever for the month of September. And that's a cost that is borne by middle class Americans. Uh, that's one of the biggest costs, biggest expenses in their lives is dealing with getting their kids to and from school, getting to work. Uh, taking care of just the day-to-day -day activities that they're responsible for, the cost of fuel is a very important pocketbook issue to middle-class Americans. And then you have news that the Kaiser Foundation uh, came out with that, that says that health care costs, health care premiums, have gone up by 29%. Now that is despite all the assertions when Obamacare was being debated that it would drive health care costs down. In fact, the president, as he campaigned for office, four years ago, talked about bringing 
the average premium for an average family, I should say, the premium for an average family down by $2,500. Well, the opposite has happened. According to the Kaiser Foundation, health insurance costs have gone up by 29%. And instead of coming down by $2,500 for the average family, they've gone up by over $3,000 for the average family. So whether it's health care costs, fuel costs, uh, tuition costs, which by the way have gone up by 25%, uh, you see this, the, in, in average incomes which have gone down, you see this worsening picture for middle class Americans. And all of that will be dramatically complicated by what's going to happen on January 1st if we don't take action to avert that crisis. And what happens January 1st, as I mentioned, you've got a across the board cut uh, that, that it's across the board in the sense that everything gets hit, but not everything gets hit proportionally. Defense, as I said, gets 50% of the cuts uh, although it represents only 20% of the budget. But you're going to have all these uh, cuts that take effect that hurt the national security budget and the jobs that go with that. But you also have, you also have taxes going up. Tax rates go up on January 1st that will absolutely devastate uh, job creation in this country if they're allowed to take effect. In fact, um, the total amount of tax increases that will hit us on January 1st if Congress doesn't take action over a 10-year period is about $5 trillion, about $5 trillion uh, over a 10-year period in additional taxes. And even if you say, as the President does, that we want taxes just to go up on people who make more than $200,000 a year or uh, couples who make more than $250,000 a year, you are harming almost a million small businesses, the very people that we're looking to to create the jobs to get the economy moving again. Almost a million small businesses who file income tax uh, returns. Uh, they are pass-through entities or flow-through entities organized as subchapter S corporations or LLCs, and therefore uh, they, they file their business income on their individual tax return, would see their taxes go up. Almost a million small businesses who represent uh, you know, 25 percent of the workforce, a higher 25 percent of the workforce in this country. And so that, that is a, a, uh, a huge tax increase that is facing job creators in this country come January 1 of this year. So, Mr. President, these are things that the, the Congress, the United States Senate, the President of the United States ought to be focused on. And yet, we aren't getting that focus. In fact, it's hard to get even information from the President of the United States about how he would implement the sequestration uh, proposal. And we had uh, passed legislation earlier this summer, which he signed into law in, in August, which required him to submit to the Congress a proposal for how he would implement sequestration. We finally, after a delay, missed the deadline, received that last week. But again, it lacks specificity, it lacks detail. Uh, Congress asked to have that on a program, uh, project-specific uh, area, and uh, we didn't get that. And so as a consequence, uh, again, still operating without the information that's necessary to do something to replace uh, that, uh, that sequestration. And I have to say that um, the House of Representatives has attempted, they passed in their budget and the subsequent reconciliation bill that went with it, a replacement for this sequestration so that we wouldn't have this uh, half a trillion dollar cut in our national security budget and all the um, attendant problems and, and, and risks that come with that. And yet uh, that wasn't picked up, that wasn't acted on here in the United States Senate. And so um, unfortunately we are where we are, which is uh, we're going into the election season now. We haven't dealt with the across the board cuts, the sequestration. We haven't dealt with the issue of taxes going up on January 1st on the people who create jobs in this country. And for that reason, we've got all these analysts, independent analysts, government analysts, concluding the same thing. And that is we are headed for a train wreck. And that's what we ought to be focused on, Mr. President, right now. And, and frankly, that's not going to happen unless we get some leadership from the President of the United States. You've got to have the President engaged, involved in these discussions if we're going to try and solve this problem. And I, I, um, I would hope that the leadership here in the United States Senate would be a partner to that as well. I know that there are Republicans here. Uh, we have tried to get votes on uh, ways to replace the sequestration. Or, or come up with a substitute for the defense cuts that it includes. We have uh, tried and actually gotten some votes on extending the tax rates at the end of the year, but that was voted down here. 
Um, but the Democrat leadership in the United States Senate has got to be a party to the discussions, as does the President of the United States, in order for us to do what's necessary to avert what we know is going to be a calamity come January 1, unless we change course. And so, Mr. President, I would, uh, as, we, as we begin to conclude the, this particular session of the Senate, I see my colleague from Wyoming, uh, the Senator from uh, Wyoming, Senator Barrasso, is here, physician and doctor, I know who uh, uh, has spoken at great length about the impact of many of the policies that are coming out of Washington on our small businesses, on our middle class. And I certainly uh, would uh, want to give him an opportunity to, to make some observations about that as well. But uh, I just want to conclude by saying that I hope that before um, this catastrophe hits us, that we have the foresight and the willingness to take on and the courage to take on these big issues. And you can't solve big issues in this city without leadership. And that's going to take leadership from the President of the United States. It's going to take leadership in the United States Senate. And as I stand here today, we haven't seen that. We haven't passed a budget in three years. We haven't dealt with any of the long-term problems that are posed and raised by the fiscal cliff that hits us on January the 1st of this year. I hope that changes. I hope we see that leadership. And I hope that we can get this country back on track. Mr. President, I yield the floor.